Welcome to another episode of Voices. I'm your host, Keston Jones. Visionaries offering information with clarity, expertise, and substance. We are content experts. Let your voice be heard. Welcome to another episode of Voices. I'm your host, Keston Jones. Voices, visionaries offering information with clarity, expertise, and substance. And today I have a very special guest, Mr. Patrick Freeman. Yes, sir. How you All doing? Right. I'm good. I'm good. Bro. <laughs> appreciate you. Ha- appreciate having you on the I show. Appreciate you having um, being here. You know, uh, this particular topic um, is so, is one that I think is very important for us to hear about. But before we we go into the topic, let me briefly read you um, Patrick's bio so you can learn a little bit about him. Um, Patrick grew up in the heart of Brooklyn, New York, in the '70s. Being one of seven children, he was destined to discover his unique purpose in the world. Um, some of us, we still haven't discovered our unique purpose. Absolutely. Um, one of, as one of the youngest in his family, he was able to absorb information about key issues facing African Americans from his older siblings, mm. um, wherein he you know, first realized that finances and learning about personal finances is very important. In undergrad, um, you studied um, psychology, psychology, but specifically financial psychology, um, where you, whereas you received your bachelor's from the College of New Rochelle. Yes. Currently, um, Patrick is pursuing his MSW degree at Lehman College um, social work program, and you uh, work for a number of groups, work in a number of groups, specifically yes. um, um, for the farm, found yes. they, for, um, um, for the farm, mm-hmm. community li- li- liaison for the Real Dads Network, mm-hmm. and a number of other areas. So um, without further ado, this bio was very extensive. Really appreciate the work that you do. Thank and you, really sir. appreciate the work that you Thank continue you. to do. So, um, you know, please tell me about yourself and what led you to um, the path that you're on, especially as it relates to finances um, for people of color um, in communities that are marginalized. Okay. Well, um, as you said in the bio, uh, I was a part of a, a large family. Growing up in Brooklyn, I was number six out of seven children. And, you know, I saw my parents struggle, mm. you know, financially to provide for us. And then when it was my turn to uh, be a father, you know, I was a young father, young husband, 28 years old, just really getting started. And, you know, understanding money wasn't something that my parents taught me. Um, I just picked up, like a lot of us, what we saw, you know, what they did. Whether it was healthy or unhealthy, um, but when it was my goal, uh, I said, you know, I really have to get this under cap. I have to understand uh, money for my own purposes and my family. Mm. So I began to read as much as I can, you know, what I saw around me, Black Enterprise. I had uh, some role models around me, and the more I learned, the more I realized that I didn't know and our community didn't know. Mm. And uh, so for me, you know, I often tell a story when I first got started, the first company I went to, the financial company, they had all the newbies sit around and write a little essay about why we wanted to get involved with finance. And, you know, a lot of people talked about the money side, the building the wealth. Uh, I want to sell this, I want products, I want stocks. and you know, have the car, the house, and what have you, and that's fine. Mm. Uh, I think my only, I was the only one whose paper said, I want to master this so that I can bring it back to my community. I want, I want to be empowered so that I can help empower others, right? Mm. And, you know, and that has been my path with this whole thing, um, understanding uh, finance and understanding that we really didn't understand the finance. So uh, I've been in finance for 20 years. Mm. I ran my own company under John Hancock, under AXA Financial, um, Allstate. Did well because for me it wasn't a job, it was it was a mission. And the more I learned, the more I realized that, you know, one of the things that motivated me was that there was a huge gap between black and white wealth. There was a huge income inequality. And I wanted to understand why. Mm. You know, what's going on here? And I want to do my part to help alleviated. So so when you talk about this the huge gap which um, many of us are familiar with we see it in these in these communities where um, you know white communities 
Caucasian communities yeah. often have more resources. Mm -hmm. Their schools are, 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 are better um, funded, whereas yes. in communities of color, it's mostly, in a lot of communities of color, um, I, I might say, is um, there's a lot of poverty, there's mm -hmm. a lot of violence and crime. What, what, what do you think, um, or can you talk about the perspective that communities of color have have when it comes to finance? Um, well, we to do, we have to uh, go back in mm. order to come forward, and we we can't act like slavery didn't happen. Mm. Um, you know, in terms of gap, in terms of wealth, and knowledge and information about money, uh, working for people for over four hundred years, never getting paid, and while another people are getting paid, they're moving forward and they're investing in the world. That creates a huge gap. And, you know, then there was Jim Crow laws and mm. what have you that didn't allow black people to buy property, which is a huge way to build wealth. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot going on. Redlining. The, redlining. You know, you, you could name it. We could be here all day. You yeah. know? Um, but we, I, I wanted to mention it because a lot of people try to skate over it. No, we can't because it's part of the mix. Yeah. It's a part of what happened. And then, you know, you have the politics, you know, um, like you said. Um, the, the school districts and the better quality of school, but in a lot of uh, minority or black and Latino communities, you, you have poor education, yeah. you know, low value education. And then how are they to compete with their, their peers on that level who have got a great uh, opportunity in terms of education? So a lot of times what's left is crime, imprisonment, um, not to mention the Rockefeller laws that, you know, and different things that just railroaded black people in the prisons. Absolutely. To help keep that yeah. status quo. So you, and, and I think I, I see you marrying the two. Yes. In terms of finances and the importance of, of being aware and knowledgeable of finance. But yes. you mentioned your essay was the only one that also spoke about the need to empower your community. Yes. And, um, you know, right now you're in an MSW program. Yes. Can you talk about why or what was what led you to believe that this was a, a direction that you needed to go in order to, um, you know, live up to the essay that you wrote? Mm -hmm. Um, well, you know, it, it's, it's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny because, you know, from a financial perspective, and I was doing that for so many years, um, and as a husband and a father, going through a, you know, a difficult divorce and being marginalized, if you will, as a father, I began to realize the way the courts see fathers and the way the system see fathers. And as much as I've been active in my children's life, now I'm on the outside fighting to get in to exercise a right that was mine when they were born. Mm. I said, this is not right, you know, and I'm not, I can't take it sitting down. So I began to research and realize that through social work, they deal with the family on a level, but they also deal with policies and procedures. So to impact those policies and procedures, you have to be a part of the game. Mm. So. On the inside, I started to learn. I went to grad school and worked with fathers because that's new groundbreaking work. And at Lehman College, they understand. And not a lot of people understand the concept of fatherhood and its importance to the family. Mm. From what I understand, social work mostly dealt with mothers and children, you know. And that's fine, but when you talk about a family, you talk about a unit, you talk about a father, a mother, and children. Yeah. So that is where I started with it. But now I'm also realizing that, you know, financial services is actually a policy of social work. And there was actually research done where they wanted uh, social workers to understand that you're helping your clients to understand life. You have to understand finances because you deal with that on a daily basis with your clients. Absolutely. So they, they are married. Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, speaking of the work that you're doing, um, on a social work side, on a human side, yes. on, a, um, on a supportive side, you um, work for an organization called The Farm. Yes. Foundation for the Advancement and Rehabilitation of, of the marginalized. marginalized. Yes, sir. Shout out to The Farm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, absolutely. Can you talk about um, the work that you're doing in particular in Rikers Island, okay. um, working with the youth, and how receptive are they in um, learning about finances? Okay. So through the farm and yourself, and I thank you for that, um, seeing the uh, ability in me to go in and talk with our young people, you know, and um, 
and I'm talking to males, at one point it was 16 through 21, and now there were changes on Rikers Island, so they're only 18 through 21. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's funny because, you know, my son is 18, and I talked about the struggle to be in their life, but now I have an opportunity to talk to so many of my sons yeah. that are 18, you know. And when I'm talking to them, I see their potential. You know, I don't go in and see them as a number and an inmate and a criminal and what have you. You can't work with them with that attitude. You have to see their ability that maybe they don't even see and no one ever told them. So when I go in and I approach it and I tell them we're going to talk about money, uh, they're pretty receptive. You know, once they sit down, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, they want to see who's going to be the first one to sit down, you know, and that's kind of funny. But when they do, um, we get into it, yeah. you know, and we're not just talking about money. You know, I slip in about their family because money is when we talk about money, you have to talk about your family. You have to talk about what you saw. You have to talk about your experience because who you are today and how you handle money today, like I said earlier, is based on what you saw. Yeah. You know, so there's a psychology behind money, yeah. you know, right. and um, so I married it to. And I talk to them from that perspective, and they really get into it. They talk about their parents. They talk about what they saw. They talk about the mistakes they made. Um, they talk about what landed them in this situation to be at Rikers. Um, and, you know, we, I take the PowerPoint, and I broke it down into four, you know, edible, if you will, eatable pieces that I don't want to give it all to them at one time. Yeah. And I leave it with them so that, and I tell them, I say, I'm going to leave this with you so that when you get out. So I'm talking in their future. I'm, t I'm giving them vision because without vision, the people perish. Yeah. And I, I tell them, you're gonna be out of here one day. And when you're gone, when you're out of here, you, you should have some tools in your toolbox that'll help you stay away from this reality. Yeah. And they appreciate it, man. Yo, oh, man, yo, yeah. gee, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you coming and talking to me, you know? And sometimes when the first two or three brave ones sit down, it's always another contingent before I finish that come around and, hey, what's going on now? And they want to know. And then I give them one of the PowerPoints and we all sit down. We have a good time. Absolutely. Shout out to Friends of Island Academy Absolutely, as yes. well yes, um, sir. for their work and, and really um, supporting the farm. Yes. Um, really appreciate you um, being a part of the team. Thank you. Um, for the work that we do on Rikers Island is very important. And one of the things that we really appreciate and the, kid, and the youth really appreciate is the fact that we come back. Yes. Many of them, um, you know, they, they are part of families that may have been separated or, mm. or what have you. And, and when they look at adults, um, many adults don't keep their word. Yes. So when they see us come back and see us invested in the work, um, it, it really, it really, um, you know, pays tremendous dividends in Absolutely. terms of working with them. Um, Absolutely. So again, um, really appreciate having you here, um, especially into talking here. about the work that you do. Um, continue it. The yes. community needs it. Uh, any final thoughts um, in terms of the, um, any upcoming projects? And how can the people get in contact with you um, to, to learn about your work? Uh, well, I mean, I'm on uh, Instagram, I'm on Facebook, and I'm, under, I'm on Facebook under Patrick Freeman, you okay. know, um, and, you know, hopefully we'll be doing a lot more projects that we can bring to the public, you know, along with the farm, because we're making a lot of headway, mm. you know, and um, people are realizing that, you know, the farm is actually impactful, you know, mm. in our community. So, yeah, look for it. Look, look for that. Absolutely, man. So again, once again, it's another episode of Voices, Visionaries Offering Information with Clarity, Expertise, and Substance. Um, thanks again to my guest, you, Mr. Patrick Freeman, thanks, for guest. being for here. Me, um, you know, it's often said that those closest to the problem is often closest to the solution. We need to hear from individuals like us um, because we are content experts. Um, you guys be great. Yes. Let us know what you, um, how you feel about this presentation, um, this particular episode. Um, what are your thoughts? Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts about, about finances, especially in the black community? Is yes. there a need for more, more education? Is there a need for more curriculums in schools that educate youth on um, the importance of finances? Let's hear from you. Once again, I'm your host, Kesson Jones, signing off. Peace. Peace.